Hello, I'm Theodora Goss, and the title of my presentation is Reading Acacia Seeds, Decentering Anthropocentrism in the Short Fiction of Ursula K. Le Guin. Um, I wish I'd made that a little bit easier to say. I first proposed this paper in the fall of 2019, never imagining what the next year would bring. A global pandemic, restrictions on how we go to school, buy groceries, or visit grandparents, precautions against a virus that travels through the air like the old concept of miasma, and of course the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. It was written in anticipation of another crisis in which our climate is changing to make life unsustainable for human beings on this planet. We tend to talk about that crisis in less panic terms because it seems distant, although scientists keep telling us that it's closer than we think even if I'm writing this on a snowy day in Massachusetts, the sort of day climate change deniers point to when they assert that we are all just fine. But the COVID-19 pandemic is that other crisis reminding us it is in fact already here. As far as we know, this virus is circulating in the human species because of our fundamentally problematic relationship with the natural world that we exploit and destroy and its other inhabitants, bats, for example. In the midst of this crisis, many of us have asked ourselves, what can we contribute? Most of us are not frontline workers, not nurses, farm laborers, grocery store employees. The people who treat us when we are sick, bring us our food, or take away our trash are essential to society in a way we often don't reward or recognize. But what do writers and scholars, particularly of fantasy, have to contribute? I want to answer that question by looking at the work of Ursula K. Le Guin, who asserted that fantastical fiction has a fundamental role to play in our society. I want to start by looking at her essay, The Critics, the Monsters, and the Fantasists, in which she argues for the importance of fantasy literature at this historical moment. For Le Guin, Alexander Pope's dictum that the proper study of mankind is man constitutes a kind of psychological poison related to the pollution destroying our physical ecosystem. Fantasy allows us to decenter anthropocentrism. In doing so, it offers us an escape from a wholly human, but paradoxically inhumane world. Then I want to look at three short stories, the author of the Acacia Seeds, Mazes, and The Direction of the Road, in which Le Guin, <laughs> Le Guin <laughs> shows us what fantastical fiction that engages with the non-human would look like. Okay, so let's start with The Critics, The Monsters, and The Fantasists. In The Critics, The Monsters, and The Fantasists, Le Guin offers what she calls a non-defining statement about the relationship between realism and the fantastic. Realistic fiction is drawn toward anthropocentrism, fantasy away from it. And you can see the, uh, the entire quotation on the slides. One reason we should value fantasy, according to Le Guin, is that it allows us to imaginative it allows us imaginative access and connection to the natural world. The fields and forests, the villages and by roads, once did belong to us when we belonged to them. That is the truth of the non-industrial setting of so much fantasy. It reminds us of what we have denied, what we have exiled ourselves from. She goes on to state, specifically of non-human animals, that they were once more to us than meat, pests, or pets. They were fellow creatures colleagues, dangerous equals. In fiction, including her own, fantastical beasts such as the dragons of Earthsea remind us that the human is not the universal, that the world includes fauna and flora as conscious and aware as we ourselves. She concludes, what fantasy often does that the realistic novel generally cannot do is include the non-human as essential. This, by the way, is one of my favorite Le Guin essays, um, and it's, I think, one of the smartest defenses of fantasy out there. So, how does Le Guin decenter the human and center a non-human perspective in her short fiction? Uh, and by the way, I have links to the uh, images uh, on the very last slide. Let's look at the author of the Acacia Seeds, the story that gave me the title for this paper. That story, which is divided into three sections, is subtitled and other extracts from the Journal of the Association of Therolinguistics, which is uh, her coinage, actually. Thero from the Greek means a wild beast, according to the OED. Presumably, Le Guin's Therolinguists study animal languages. 
The first section discusses possible translations of a manuscript written in touch gland exudation on degerminated acacia seed found in an anthill. The most puzzling part of the manuscript is the final blasphemous phrase, eat the eggs, up with the queen. Our translators argue that this phrase must be understood in the context of how an ant might experience the world, in which up means food, but also danger, while down represents home and safety. A better human approximation, we are told, might be down with the queen. The seeds are found near the desiccated body of a flightless female worker ant whose head has been severed from her thorax, presumably by a soldier. What we have here, if we can read ant, is a revolutionary. But to do so, we must see the world from an ant's perspective. The second section announces an expedition to Antarctica to study the language of emperor penguins. It tells us that penguin languages were not properly understood until therolinguists realized penguins were birds flying through water. The most intriguing part of this section for me is the mention of an Adelie penguin literary work that can only be rendered, rendered by the full chorus of the Leningrad Ballet Company. And by the way, the picture here is an Adelie penguin. If ants write in chemical exudations, penguins write in motion through water. Imagine what a ballet that would make. Once again, Le Guin's story emphasizes the need to move beyond our human assumptions and limitations. If we can do so, we will find poetry in the murky waters of the Antarctic. The final section, an editorial by the president of the Therolinguistics Association, urges us to be even more ambitious. Remember that as late as the mid 20th century, most scientists and many artists did not believe that even dolphin would ever be comprehensible to the human brain or worth comprehending. Let another century pass and we may seem equally laughable. Do you realize the phytolinguist will say to the aesthetic critic that they couldn't even read? eggplant, and they will smile at our ignorance as they pick up their rucksacks and hike, hike up to read the newly deciphered lyrics of the lichen on the north base of Pike's Peak. Unfortunately, we do not yet speak eggplant or even dolphin, at least I don't, although Leningrad is once again St. Petersburg, but we have advanced significantly in our understanding of animal and even plant communication since Le Guin's story was published in 1974, a development that gives me hope. Perhaps someday I will be able to see a penguin ballet. In Mazes and the Direction of the Road, Le Guin writes directly from non-human perspectives. In Mazes, that of a laboratory rat, and in the Direction of the Road, that of an oak tree standing by the side of what used to be a dirt road, but is now a busy highway. Both stories show the destructive effects of human-centered consciousness. In Mazes, the narrator describes a gigantic alien that places it in a series of mazes which it understands as aesthetic constructs where it can create dances meant to communicate. But the alien is interested only ha in having it push buttons for what it considers disgusting dead food. It sees that alien, that the alien is intelligent, a builder of mazes, yet seems intent only on torturing our narrator with meaningless, incomprehensible tasks. It tries again and again to understand its captor. It has eyes, recognizable eyes. They are enough like our eyes that it must see somewhat as we do. It has a mouth, four legs, can move bipedally, has grasping hands, etc. For all its gigantism and strange looks, it seems less fundamentally different from us physically than a fish. And yet fish school and dance and in their own stupid way communicate. The alien has never once attempted to talk to me. It has been with me, watched me, touched me, handled me for days. But all its motions have been purposeful, not communicative. It is evidently a solitary creature, totally self-absorbed. This would go far to explain its cruelty. The narrator knows that it will die soon of malnutrition and existential despair. It tells us that its captor will not understand the dance I dance in dying. In the direction of the road, we see the road from the perspective of an oak tree who must uphold our own illusion of movement by matching the speed and direction of human or mechanical motion. 
It tells us about the shock and trauma of being involved in a car accident in which it had to kill a man. The story critiques a world that moves ever faster under the illusion that speed is progress. In both of these stories, we see a non-human consciousness looking at the human in a deeply critical way. To be human is to be dense, stupid, incomprehending. As the oak tree tells us, if the human creatures will not understand relativity very well, but they must understand relatedness. Unfortunately, they do not. It is our inability to understand our relationship with rats and trees and lichen that has gotten us where we are, which Le Guin warns us is a dangerous place, not only for the planet we inhabit, but for us physically and psychologically. We need fantastical literature because it can teach us how to see and hear and perhaps even dance. Although I have focused on these three stories, if we had enough time, we could also look at narratives such as the wife story, a reverse werewolf tale in which the wolf wife is horrified when her husband transforms into a pale, hairless, hideous beast. I have a lot of fun teaching this, by the way, because my students suddenly go, oh, wait, he's transforming into us, <laughs> right? Or Buffalo Gals, won't you come out tonight, in which a young girl, sole survivor of a plane wreck, encounters a world of non-human forces from Native American legend and belief more real than the industrial world replacing them. And if we had a leisurely afternoon by the pool in Orlando, we could also discuss Always Coming Home, Le Guin's novel-length description of a future ecological utopia, or as close as Le Guin ever came to describing utopia. It shows us what an organic, communal, ecologically responsible human society might look like. In these novels and stories, Le Guin decenters the human, showing us that the anthrop anthropocentric, I keep having trouble with that word, anthropocentric perspective, but you can see why it's, it's a problematic word anyway. Uh, anthropocentric perspective is not the only or most important one. In doing so, she creates a space not dominated by industrial capitalism and allows us to see beyond our narrow culturally and economically conditioned viewpoint. Le Guin's fantastical narratives point toward another way of thinking and being that can restore us to psychological health as well as ecological sanity. For me, as a child of the Cold War, her essay seems particularly prescient when she writes that a purely human world can be destroyed at any moment by human agency. It is the world of the neutron bomb, the terrorist, and the next plague. We've lived through fears of nuclear war and terrorism. Here we are, one year after Le Guin's death in the midst of the next plague. But she offers us a way out of the mental mazes we have created for ourselves. The literature of the imagination, she tells us, offers a world large enough to contain alternatives and therefore offers hope. Le Guin's essay and stories imply that although writers and scholars of the fantastic are not frontline workers, they also have a job to do in this historical moment because they can teach us to look at our world through different eyes, as a place of multiple intelligences creating and communicating in a variety of artistic forms. We just have to pay attention. Okay, I'm gonna show you uh, very quickly the list of uh, works that I'm using and also here are the links to the images on the slides, that wonderful uh, ant and penguin and eggplant. <laughs> um, and, uh, Thank you so much for listening. I hope that we meet again next year in Orlando. Thank you so much.